Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Regime Change Comes to the United States, a Nicaraguan Perspective. Welcome to viewers on Zoom uh, and those of you who are watching on the Nicaraguan Solidari Solidarity Campaign Action Group Facebook page, where we are live streaming this event. Uh, before we begin tonight's or this today's event, I'd like to ask Her Excellency, the Nicaraguan Ambassador to the United Kingdom, Ireland and Iceland, Giselle Morales Echeverre, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, I will, today, uh, this week has been a very sad week um, for Nicaragua and for all those revolutionary in the war. We have lost a, lost a champion and I would like to pay tribute to Let me share the screen to Dr. Paul Oquis, known by many as, well, he was called El Gringo Bueno, the good gringo, <laughs> by, um, uh, by Hugo Chavez. That's what he called us always, Gringo Bueno. Uh, we heard about his, we knew about his um, passing away uh, and we our brought our on the 13th, very early in the 13th of, of April and our heart just broke because he was not only a minister, not only an authority in many fields, a brilliant mind. He was a comrade, a friend, a revolutionary who gave so much to our Nicaragua the Nicaragua that he adopted as his, as, as his land, um, as his homeland, uh, that he loved, he admired and respected. Uh, we mourn the loss of an unforgettable man who leaves an ex exemplary legacy of love and commitment to the, to the service of Nicaragua. His extraordinary vision, brilliant mind, profound spirit and exceptional ethos to build a better world we live forever. He was not new to those who accompany the uh, fighting against the dictatorship. He started in the 70s, recruited by Patricio Arguello that he always remembered. He came to the country in the 80s, just when the revolution triumphed, and he was in the Casa de Gobierno and shared his knowledge and experience to the libertarian and revolutionary process of dignity in the life of Nicaraguan families. He worked tireless to develop so many projects and programs to advance against the disaster that we inherited in our Nicaragua when the revolution triumphed. We all love Paul, everyone who knew him, uh, he, he, he was always so uh, generous with his time, with his knowledge. He was always ready for the new task. And um, we wish today to pay tribute to him, to his generosity, his valentia, his value, he was very, his tenacity, his loyalty, an example of true revolutionary. He had, he always said that the sanction that was imposed to him by the United States was his most value medal. President Ortega and Rosario Mur and Vice President Murillo in a press release said that today our dear comrade Paul Lopez Kelly, who served the people, the families, and all Nicaraguas with indefatigable love, faithfulness, commitment, and courage has made the journey to the house of Lord. We celebrate the life of Paul with gratitude to the Lord because he allows us to count on this special intelligence, of his, on his special intelligence, his fraternal vision, his proposal for justice and right for our people, and for the people of the world, which is an unsurmountable understanding of international relations of those organizations which he knew so well 
and with those of us with whom he related in such a profound and extraordinary matter. We celebrate the life and example of Paul, knowing that he leaves us his strength, his energies, his unwavering spirit of the struggle and victories, his determination, his coherence, his unyielding loyalty, his unfailing love for this Nicaragua that made his own, that he made his own open path, difficult at times, but also complete vital, though full of people, the people that today bid him farewell. We say goodbye with respect, recognition, and infinite affection. We embrace, we, and then um, we have received through all those uh, times since he passed away, messages of solidarity and condolence. And, and I want just to mention three. Um, as you, many of you know, he, many, he, he participated in many events in the UK. There is a photo there where he met uh, with uh, the alcalde, the, 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 law, the mayor of, um, of Bristol. And he was working with him, showing what we are doing in Nicaragua in the local communities. And, um, and he also was very vocal about his passion, which was climate change, uh, besides his anti-imperialism stance. Uh, he was a great defend defendant of the, the, the environment, and he was admired for his position in the Paris Agreement. And he was, will be always remembered um, there. He was co-president of the, of the Fondo Verde, uh, the Green Climate Fund uh, in 2018. And the South African chairman of the C, the, G, the, the Green Climate Fund, he describes Paul as a fighter for justice, um, a fighter for a, a for, for climate and the director of the initiative for the transparency of action climates, he said in a Twitter, with Paul, Paul Oakley's the climate, global climate process has lost a personality, brilliant and committed. He was difficult, but sharp and analytic, an important voice to listen with attention. I always remember his declarations in the first day of the Green Climate Fund. And um, also, I will uh, the the prom he another one that he, I want to highlight is from the activist and promoter of solidarity and peace, Bob Schwartz from New York, and he knew he expressed his condolences by saying he was a promoter of peace and justice and social justice. He served Nicaragua with loyalty and passion. We will miss him in the international scenario where his presence will contribute to elaborate progressive initiatives for the climate change, the environment, and he always believed in a better world, that a better world is possible, and it is possible. And then um, the ambassador of Javier Arrue uh, from our uh, and, and of Venezuela in Nicaragua, he said he was in, he was in, in he was in, he, did, he never tired, he was never tired, he was always full of happiness and, you know, it was looking uh, so optimistic and he always was ready for the new battles. And he was the one who defended Nicaragua and the people of Nicaragua and our commandante, uh, eternal commander, um, he admired his love for Nicaragua, the, amor, the love for the Sandinista coast, and he was the one who called him the Gringo Bueno. And, and he, undoubtedly, the aggressions that was imposed upon him was the best testimony of his loyalty to the people of Nicaragua. So we also had a very beautiful and very complete um, uh, tribute from Nicaragua Solidarity Campaign today and that highlight his life. I recommend, please, uh, if you can go to the NSC, please uh, read it. Um, but he uh, particularly, the, 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 that he, his, his personal stance 
against, against the injustice, climate injustice. Paul has left uh, to, to, to eternity. Many people and in the story of Nicaragua has been, not so many people in the history of Nicaragua has committed his life the way he did it with heroism and, and, and knowing committed his life to service for those who needed. So, compañero Paul, hasta siempre. Um, you can continue, Julie. I think, you know, I cannot thank, say anything. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank my you, tears Giselle. will come down and I will not be able to recover. So please continue. Thank you, Giselle, uh, for that wonderful tribute. And uh, just to add um, that Paul, Dr. Paul Oquist is not only a great loss to Nicaragua, but his work challenging climate change is a loss to the world and to the planet. May he rest in peace but live on in power. Um, so following our, our, sa our sad opening, uh, move now to the, um, the, ma the main meeting of this evening on this uh, webinar, regime change, comes to the, to, regime change Comes to the United States and Nicaraguan Perspective. It's my pleasure and honor to be chairing this meeting this evening. My name is Julie Lamin. Um, I'm a member of the Nicaragua Solidarity Campaign Action Group Executive Committee. I've been a secondary English teacher in the UK for my adult life and more recently an author. I became involved in solidarity with Nicaragua immediately following the 1979 revolution, uh, but I didn't actually get to visit Nicaragua until 1987, which uh, I participated in a reforestation brigade one summer but that, as many of you all know, is, was during the Contra War. We learned firsthand of the atrocities uh, committed by the Contra against Nicaraguan people. Uh, we visited war damaged hospitals and schools and se secondhand, in a way, experienced the hardships that the war had caused. And we also saw the dreadful legacy of the Somoza dictatorship, which had stripped Nicaragua of its natural resources leaving the earth bare and the water poisoned. I returned to Nicaragua 30 years later in 2017 to a very, very different Nicaragua, where the progress under the Sandinista leadership for the previous 10 years meant food was plentiful. Uh, as you know, Nicaragua is working towards food sovereignty and self-sufficiency. The roads that when we'd first gone were, were barely roads, uh, were excellent, better than some of the roads in the UK. There were clinics and hospitals in every neighbourhood, schools, colleges and universities were thriving. Uh, I went in 2017 um, as a teacher with 10 other uh, UK teachers. We'd been asked, um, our, 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 my union, our, our union, the National Education Union, had been asked to assist Nicaraguan teachers in developing a curriculum and pedagogy for teaching English as a second language, a stress second language, because this wasn't just about uh, helping young Nicaraguans to be world citizens through speaking English, but it was this far thinking nature of, of the government, uh, because as many of you will know, um, the people who live on the Atlantic coast, many of them speak English as their first language. So this was a, a, a participation of, of uniting the country uh, to make it you know, full, you know, full participation of every Nicaraguan, regardless of whether their language is English or, or Spanish. And, and to us illustrated this very forward thinking nature of the Nic and participatory nature of the Nicaraguan government. Um, as a fan of Bob Marley, the, as my favourite phrase is, we've got to know our history. And I believe it's vital to see Nicaragua's progress since 2007 to date in the, contest, in the context of its history under the United States imposed dictatorship, uh, the legacy of which we saw so clearly in, in 1987. And my 2017 visit inspired me to write a, a novel called Beyond the Volcano. It's a work of fiction, but I hopefully show that that novel uh, shows the commitment and absolute human right 
people have to determine the future of their own country free from repression and injustice. Uh, you can buy the book, quick plug, uh, through the NSC shop. It's £10, but all of that £10 goes to Nicaragua Solidarity uh, Funds. Uh, and there's a link in the chat. Uh, so, speaking of fiction, we are in a world of George Orwell's novel 1984 with doublespeak. Uh, we have a powerful media narrative that twists the truth, buries the lived experience of Nicaraguans under caricatures, inventions and elaborate lies. We have a media that gives credence to journalists without checking credentials and claims human rights abuses. And those claims lead governments to impose sanctions on, on Nicaragua and, and other uh, countries, which cause multiple abuses of human rights on a daily basis for every single citizen. So tonight in our webinar, regime change comes to the United States, a Nicaraguan perspective. We are very fortunate to have excellent speakers. Um, Niels McCune, Dan Kovalik, Colleen Littlejohn, and Her Excellency Giselle Morales Echeverre. And our speakers will highlight the parallels between what occurred during the failed attempted coup in Nicaragua in 2018 and what happened earlier this year in the United States in January. And they will show how the reactions to both events were markedly different and how in the wake of the 2018 coup in Nicaragua, the government, the Nicaraguan government, has restored democracy to protect its people. And it continues on the road to economic and social recovery as it approaches elections in November. So uh, there's a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen. Please, during the course of uh, the speeches, if you would like to ask any questions, please uh, pop your questions in there and we will address them in the session at the end after the speakers uh, have uh, have presented. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Niels McCune. I'm delighted, Neil, Niels, to have you with us this evening. Um, Niels is a research associate at the University of Vermont and visiting researcher at El Colegio de la Frontera Sur, ECOSUR in Mexico. Niels lives in Nicaragua and was in Nicaragua during the whole of the coup attempt in 2018, so has direct personal experience of events at the time. So many thanks, Niels, for being here and uh, over, over to you now for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. And, and it's really been an honor to, to be invited to this, to be here with uh, Her Excellency and also to hear that moving tribute to Paul Okis. Um, I'm going to share a very simple presentation, which gives an idea of uh, what we lived through here in Nicaragua I know that with this great panel, uh, people will be able to provide a little bit more theory, uh, but I'd just like to try to share the story. So where does this story begin? Well, uh, as Julie mentioned, many of you, I'm sure, who are participating today uh, were aware of Nicaragua in the 1970s and 80s, first as uh, a country ruled by one of the most murderous regimes, uh, you know, put into power by the United States with the National Guard having been created by the United States, the Somoza regime uh, with three different presidents of that last name, and then the revolution, right? The process that often ends in 1990 when the Sandinistas lost power and Nicaragua stopped becoming the, the revolutionary paradise that many people um, had been so moved by in their youth. But for Nicaraguans, the story of course continued and the struggle continued and so the struggle against the privatization of schools through the school autonomy law, uh, the fight against the privatization of medicine and hospitals, uh, the struggle to maintain land reform, but also the struggle for peace has really marked Nicaragua in the last three decades. So to give a little bit of the context until April of 2018, Nicaragua was living through what many considered to be the best period in its history a period of um, much enhanced gender equality which had been recognized internationally, of a great deal of safety compared especially to its neighbors in Central America, uh, a public pension system. And that public pension system will of course be the focus of uh, the next couple of minutes. But also Nicaragua had created a very particular national unity process, a reconciliation process 
in which the Sandinista Front, um, after winning the Contra War militarily but losing the elections, built a process of, uh, of, of reconciliation with the Contras. Because while the Contras were funded, of course, by Ali North and Ronald Reagan, there were also many peasants who were involved in the Contra War because they had been duped, because they were told that the Sandinistas would make uh, soap out of old people. And so people, uh, ordinary people were part of the Contra War. So creating peace, of course, those people who were part of the Contra War expected to be regarded as national heroes once uh, Sandino Comunistas were out of power, but they were completely abandoned by the national oligarchy. So they actually found that the Sandinista Front was the only movement in the country that stood for their rights. So it's important to mention this process of national unity because it comes up later. What's key to know here is that there was a process until April of 2018 in which many, many people were working with one common vision. Some of them were Sandinista party members. Others were people who maybe had been part of party structures but were now working through neighborhood organizations, et cetera. Others were people who had never been Sandinistas, but were willing to work with one another for one purpose. And this was leading to a country, the only country in Central America with a positive trade balance with the United States. It didn't buy food or arms from the United States and it was producing almost all of its food nationally. So what happened just leading up in the months leading up to the 2018 regime change attempt? First off, the medical coverage system, the, the INTS, which is the National Institute of Social Security, had been expanded greatly to include people who are part of the popular sector of the economy, those who don't have formal employment, which makes up 65% of Nicaragua's workforce. This required certain reforms to INTS, and the government was negotiating with labor unions and the private sector to deliver the kinds of reforms that would make a sustainable healthcare system. At that point, the International Monetary Fund made a visit to Nicaragua and official recommendations that included raising the retirement age and doubling the eligibility requirements, how many weeks someone would have to work to be able to have health insurance. The government rejected that neoliberal proposal and instead proposed a plan that provided more health care to more people to expand coverage through greater taxes on the private sector. So at that point, the private sector walked out on negotiations and the government with labor unions came to an agreement and passed a law and the private sector called for street protests on April 16th, 2018. So well, here began something really extraordinary. And for those of you who are interested in learning about uh, these sorts of color revolutions that we've seen in Eastern Europe and we now see in other places in Africa and they're starting to appear all over the world, the Nicaraguan case is really a fascinating study to understand what happens and how Nicaraguans reacted. So over three days, approximately 100 million anti-government messages were sent across Nicaragua, mostly through Facebook. The themes of these messages were rapidly changing, too fast for uh, the Sandinista Front, which of course is the, the largest leftist movement in Central America and uh, the most experienced leftist movement in Central America to be able to react effectively. The first round of messages talked about Occupy Ints as acting as though what the government had signed into law was in fact a neoliberal reform, when of course it was the opposite. It was a reform uh, that would include raising the taxes on the corporate sector. Then as you began to react to the idea of people being pushed off of health insurance, there began to be stories of, uh, fake stories of course, of attack by the Sandinistas against protesters. And by April 19th, the story was free speech. So there were uh, protesters, a very small number of protesters, but in most cities across the country, for free speech during the daytime. That same day, and I remember I was in Huigalpa, there was a massive rally in support of the INS reforms that was carried out with the support of the Anonista Front, its militants, its party members, and many labor unions across the country. So there was, on the day of April 19th, a massive rally in support for those uh, INTS reforms, but by then the topic had changed. The topic was now free speech democracy. And that evening, 
armed groups began making attacks on Sandinista Front headquarters throughout the country, as well as uh, public hospitals and in uh, public buildings. These messages um, work to to uh, to elicit responses from the nation. First off, they had a very intelligent use of color, right? The national flag, but also the red and black of the Sandinistas. What's incredible about this uh, this movement of the right wing, which appeared suddenly in April of 2018, is that even used Sandinista songs, right? They say the the uh, Carlos Fonseca wrote that the, the bourgeois has no items of its own, so it has to use ours. They also used symbolism. They said that April 19th has replaced July 19th. July 19th, of course, is the anniversary of the Sandinista victory. So as you can see, I'll just go back for a second. If we look at all of these images, after you see who published this person, you publicidad. Publicidad, publicidad, in each of those circled areas. And on the next page too, publicidad. What these mean is that these are paid advertisements. All of these were paid for by uh, private companies or uh, made up organizations. We see Nicaragua Libre. All of these appeared on Facebook in this onslaught of paid advertisements. But what happens as soon as somebody shares one of these, then it no longer appears as an, a paid advertisement, but rather something that a friend of yours is sharing. So that's how these messages go viral. First, they're paid for, and at a certain point, they have a momentum of their own. But what's interesting is that they also used messages that were totally different for different sectors of society. On the right here, we have the, the beauty queen sort of, uh, this model of message. On the left we have, which is suggesting that Daniel Ortega be lynched, as was uh, Mutmar Gaddafi. Uh, then there was also these pretend political movements, right? Uh, uh, Sandinista Committee of Italy, uh, the the movement of the disappeared of the twentieth of the nineteenth and twentieth of April. All of these sprang up overnight, and as we can see again, these are paid publicity. So using images from other countries. Uh, doctored images, images taken out of context from different years. Uh, people learned that there were Cuban soldiers patrolling the streets or that the army had occupied Managua. And of course, these are patently false, but this is what people really thought was happening, particularly effective with those who were not out on the street. So what's important to recognize here is also the youth of the middle and upper middle class really, really, really was taken in by these messages. So in terms of Nicaraguans, who was behind this? As we started to see uh, after a week or so and, and the, the, the side sort of became clear, uh, there was a, a, a conglomeration of, of NGOs, more than opposition political parties. And this is important because opposition political parties really have no support in Nicaragua. I think the strongest support that any opposition party gets is around 12% of the vote. So they've been very discredited because they carried out all the neoliberal reforms during 17 years of neoliberalism. As a result, the NGO sector, sector that the United States Embassy has, has really focused on financing, and they're the ones who have been working on developing uh, these training programs with around 5,000 young people in the country, which took place over years, on uh, developing the, the skills for advocacy, uh, civil engagement, democracy, political leadership. And all of these courses were financed by um, sort of a, a network of NGOs, but behind them, the funding came from USAID, the National Endowment for Democracy and the Catholic Church. And what's really chilling about this, is these WhatsApp groups. So across Nicaragua, there's very popular WhatsApp groups as just about anywhere nowadays. And some of them are used for classifieds, like if you wanna buy a motorcycle or you wanna sell a chainsaw or, or whatever it is that people go to classified ads for. And others that are like to find out where the party is that night, right? What's the Friday scene like? These WhatsApp groups became 100% focused on uh, insurrection immediately uh, by April 18th. So they completely changed their purpose and that also threw a lot of people off guard. 
then these uh, roadblocks, right? The what made peace so difficult, what made uh, negotiation and and the recovery of of sort of um, people's psychological well-being, the months of this regime change attempt in 2018 were the roadblocks that prevented people from being to travel across the country, um, prevented people from going to work, from going to school, prevented people seeing how their loved ones were doing. I personally was unable to leave the, the town that I was in for 80 days because there were armed roadblocks on both sides of town with um, AK-47s and M16s and other very heavy weaponry, which uh, we could hear at nighttime and which were terrifying, absolutely terrifying. And of course, um, persuaded us not to try to, to leave town. I remember uh, people, their, their Sandinista, uh, the, the Sandinista party has a carnet. It's like a, a party membership card, people hiding them in their sock drawers, everyone being very, very terrified of being identified as a Sandinista uh, sympathizer because there were lynchings being carried out across the country. Many, many Sandinistas had their homes burned. Um, others were beaten. Uh, in our town, there was a family where everyone in the family so several lot broken arms, broken rib. And so the Sandinistas were moving uh, people into safe houses across the country, moving food around, trying to make sure that people could could survive this and also trying to take um, very uh, equitable positions, trying to seek dialogue and trying to, to figure out what, what was going on, right? Where, where the hatred was coming from because it's only with hindsight that we're able to see really how this was crafted. But anyway, uh, just to give you an idea, NGOs were, were very uh, much in the where they were very much in the planning phase of all this. Opposition political parties clearly had a, a strong role, although they pretended not to be opposition parties. They pretended to be apolitical or uh, autoconvocados, as they called the, the self, self-convoked people, self-convened people is the proper translation. But also um, there was a certain sort of a, a criminal edge to it. So even within neighborhoods, it was the the young guys who never participate in garbage cleanup, who never uh, help anyone to get water, who were letting themselves be hired as gunmen or, or um, uh, to intimidate others. So there was sort of this, this criminal side to it, which has to do with uh, social consciousness. And how it so in the end, it had faces. It had a, a pretty face that it presented to the media, uh, a pretty face that met with uh, U.S. politicians, and it also had a, a very terrifying criminal sort of thug um, intimidation tactics, uh, including um, rape, including murder, including burning people's homes down. So what did we get out of all of this, right? We, we got education for international sanctions. Uh, the most far-right elements of the United States Congress pushing through the NICA Act, there's a campaign of hostility everywhere, particularly uh, aware of uh, how difficult it is to even speak in favor of uh, a dialogue or, or um, respect for the electoral process. There's a, a very strong pro-coup uh, attitude, even among those who consider themselves to be part of the left. Uh, there's continuous financial support for destabilization. The idea is really to exhaust uh, the Nicaraguans and to make the economy scream, just like they did with Chile and just like they're doing with Venezuela today. And then all of this combines, of course, with um, the, the coup attempt, the NICA Act, the pandemic, and these two very powerful hurricanes of the last year. So uh, that's where we're at. The story has not ended. The Nicaraguan people, time and again, uh, surprised uh, the power of empire. So. Uh, here we are, and, and I'm very excited to hear from the other speakers. Much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Neil, for uh, such um, an insightful report and, uh, you know, conveying to us not just the absolute terror of being there, but the, the depth of and breadth of manipulation. Uh, so thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to meet again. Um, 
Dan. Uh, we I had the good fortune to be at one of your meetings a couple of years ago, so it gives me great pleasure now to uh, introduce Dan Kovalik. Uh, Dan is an American lawyer and human rights advocate who's followed Nicaragua's politics for the last four decades. He is Senior Research Fellow, COA Council on Hemispheric Affairs, and lecturer on international human rights at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He has written a number of books, the latest of which is No More War. At the start of 2020, he also produced a documentary film, Nicaragua, The April Crisis and Beyond, which seeks to set the record straight on what really happened during the 2018 coup. My personal view here is that I really recommend, strongly recommend you watch this excellent film and share it with your friends and organisations and there will be a link in the chat. But a great pleasure to have you here tonight, Dan. So over, over to you. Thank you, Julie. And thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. I see a lot of old friends uh, and it and, uh, gives me a lot, of, a lot of hope and courage. Um, uh, I'm happy to be talking about a country that changed my life. I mean, and it changed many people's lives. And I have to just reiterate that. I tell anyone who listened that that's the case. People say, you know, how, how do you get to be who you are today? You know, you grew up in this real conservative, you know, Catholic home. And um, uh, now I'm, you know, a leftist. And, you know, how'd that happen? And, you know, I got one word for that, and it's Nicaragua. And now there's a lot of people out there who have the same story. You know, those of us who went to Nicaragua in the 80s and we saw the courage of the Nicaraguan people standing up to the greatest military power in the world, the United States, who was terrorizing Nicaragua. And that's what it was. It was terrorizing. You know, the U.S. supported the Contras who never gained one blade of, gla of, of grass within Nicaragua never held any territory. They had no popular support, but they did manage to terrorize the country, kill doctors, kill engineers, teachers, including an American engineer, Ben Linder. Um, and that was the, the tack they took. And to some extent it was effective. The, the Contra war combined with US economic sanctions uh, did play a huge role in the loss of the Sandinistas in the election of 1990. Essentially, the US held a gun to Nicaragua's head and said, you know, if you vote for the San Daniel Ortega and the Sandinistas, we will continue the Contra War, which by then, by the way, was illegal, right? Congress had, had, had made it illegal to fund, but Reagan, as we know, kept funding it through cocaine sales and sales of weapons to Iran. Um, but the U.S. said, hey, we're going to continue the uh, Contra war against you. We're going to ki keep killing uh, innocent civilians in your country and destroying electric power plants and whatnot. Um, if you vote for Ortega, we're also going to continue sanctions against your country, which are making it hard for the Sandinistas to carry out the social programs that they, they were trying to carry out. Um, on the other hand, if you if you vote for the opposition, Violeta Chamorro, we will end the Contra war, we will end sanctions, and guess what, we'll even give you some money, we'll give you some uh, humanitarian aid. And the result was uh, the defeat of Danny Ortega. And I remember that time, I mean, and, and all of us felt it, not, not just in Nicaragua, but outside Nicaragua, we felt a great sorrow. And even at least as I understood it, a lot of people in Nicaragua felt terrible because in, in many people cast a vote against Ortega more as a protest vote because they figured he was going to win. And then the next day when it was clear Chamorro had won, you know, uh, there was a silence that kind of broke all over the country, you know. But I think those lessons that we see from the Contra War from the election of 1990, uh, the same thing's happening now. Uh, first of all, just, I mean, I think Niels did an amazing job describing what happened in the summer of 2018, but I'll just say that, you know, what happened then looked a lot like the Contra War. I mean, what you had was 
uh, armed groups which rose up and terrorized the population and effectively terrorized them. Um, as Neil said, uh, you know, uh, it was open season on Sandinistas. I remember, so I, I went to Nicaragua in July of uh, 2018 as the crisis was beginning to ebb. And I remember meeting um, with a woman, very impressive uh, woman there from Cinematique, who was recounting what had happened that summer and she began to cry and she said, you know, at one point we thought you could never carry the red and black flag again. I mean, that's how serious it felt that San Denisimo had been uh, almost eradicated at some point. And I remember from the vantage point of the United States, it felt that way. Like every, you know, so many of us who, you know, our hearts, you know, are uh, pump red, you know, black and red blood now. We, we were just so pained to see this, right? And what I'd like to say, I mean, what, what's quite interesting about what happened, some of my analysis just to add to Neil's was, there's a certain irony to this. Some of the gains that, that the people had under the Sandinistas are what allowed the coup to take place, right? During the neoliberal years, uh, the government did nothing to electrify the country, for example. I think it was like 15% unelectri- uh, or 15% electrified when Ortega was reelected in 2006. Now it's at least approaching 100% electrified. In addition, the Sandinista government uh, not only spread electricity throughout the country, but also free Wi-Fi, even in public parks, right? And so what did this do? these good benefits do for the coup planners. They were able to use something that the Nicaraguans really didn't have much access to before Danielle was elected in 2006. And that is the internet. Uh, and so what happened was the coup planners were able to use that internet and social media, something that was pretty new to most Nicaraguans uh, to wage an incredible propaganda campaign against the Sandinistas. You know, one person I interviewed for the film said, you know, at, at the time when this was happening, we all believed what was on social media. If it's on the internet, it must be true, right? I mean, and there was a certain naivete because this was a new thing, right? And so um, the, the, the right wing was able to take uh, advantage of that. Um, to, to be able to um, to seriously undermine um, Ortega. The other thing that I think allowed for people to be fooled, particularly young people um, in uh, Nicaragua, and by the way, most Nicaraguans are young. It's a very young country, right? Uh, at the time of the Sandinista revolution, there weren't even 3 million people in Nicaragua. Now I think there's like 6 million. So it's, you know, the population's, you know, more than double. So they have a very young population. Now, they, you know, one thing that occurred to me was that, that the young people, especially, you know, who were 18, 19, 20, they grew up during the neoliberal years. So they weren't being educated in the schools about the Sandinista revolution or they were being miseducated about it. They didn't have the ideological grounding uh, because those were kind of lost years um, between 1990 and 2007 uh, when, when Ortega uh, retook um, pre the presidential office. And so again, the, the, the right wing with the help of the U.S. had a crack at overthrowing Ortega at this point. I think they had, they had a big shot and, 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 and frankly though, it was one shot they had because um, again, they, they were able to take the country unawares for the reasons I just said. And, and they were nearly successful. I mean, I remember, again, from my vantage point in the U.S., it seemed that uh, Ortega would resign. That, that was my perception, that he, he was on the ropes there in April and May of uh, 2018. But he was brilliant. I mean, he really... 
the interesting thing that he did was to essentially let the right wing expose themselves for the terrorists they were, right? So one, while Neil said that, the, you know, that there were claims the army took over Managua, the army stayed in its bases, right? The head of the army was very clear. We exist to defend the homeland against invaders. We are not here to, to do domestic policing. So they never hit the streets. Uh, at some point, the opposition, and it's one of these things, be careful what you wish for. They said, oh, the police, which, by the way, hitherto, prior to April of 2018, were considered some of the best trained community police in the hemisphere. And in fact, people throughout the region, you know, learned and, and took lessons from the police in Nicaragua. Um, but the right wing said, oh, the police, they're oppressing us. Get the police off the streets. And Danielle was like, OK. He, took the, he sent the police to the barracks for it was a significant amount of time, something like 50 days or something like that. Um, and what that what happened, of course, is that the right wing went wild and they did awful things, including attack some of the police barracks. I think 22 policemen were killed during this time. Um, but they, again, terrorized the population. And I think people then saw, hey, you know, we now know who the bad guys are. It's these guys out on the street, not the cops who aren't even on the streets. And people began to wise up uh, pretty quickly. And then they called. They said, for God's sake, will you take the police out of the barracks and protect us? And, you know, the Sandinistas very quickly were able to retake uh, the streets because people were relieved. I mean, they, they were being held captive by these crazies, really, some of her were actually criminal elements brought in from El Salvador and whatnot. Um, so it was an incredible event. And I think in, in some ways probably um, secured, um, you know, the Sandinista uh, political um, hold in Nicaragua, because I think people realized who they could trust. And it wasn't the opposition, it was the Sandinistas. And again, the polls I'm seeing are that, again, if the elections were held today, Danielle would win pretty handily. But what we know is going to happen is that between now and, and the elections in the fall, there will be more misinformation. There will be provocations. Uh, there will be probably more economic sanctions um, is, is if you could do a lot more than the NECA Act is so draconian. And it needs to be pointed out, by the way, Niels, of course, is right that the 2018 crisis gave the impetus for the, the NECA Act to be passed, ultimately. But the NECA Act was on the table way before the 2018 crisis, right? And, and that's important to point out, is that uh, the 2018 crisis didn't create the NECA Act, um, and um, the U.S. was waiting for a pretext to, to, to take what was already there, the NECA Act, and get it passed, and the 2018 crisis was the um, impetus uh, for, for that, um, and that's, I think, important to point out, and, and that has cut Nicaragua off from a lot of international financing, which the government was using for social programs. And again, it's a means of, like in 1990, putting pressure on the people. Um, the clear, the clear uh, message that the U.S. is sending is, if you vote for Ortega, uh, you know we're just going to keep sanctioning you, and if you vote against him, we're going to stop the sanctions and give you money. So. It's really a form of, of, of very unfair pressure on the political system, and, and but that's going to continue. The one thing I want to say is that while I think the Nicaraguan people understood by the you know the end of the summer of 2018 what really happened, and that the Sandinistas in fact were their protectors and not their oppressors, a lot of the rest of the world hasn't figured that out. I think that's fair to say. Um, even a lot of people on the left 
in the West don't get it. They, they, they bought the program. They bought the lies in 2018. They bought the lies, frankly, against Ortega that have existed even well before that. And uh, by and large, uh, that um, propaganda has been effective um, in countries outside Nicaragua. And I think that's our job to try to overcome that. Um, because people have been fooled. I mean, it's just interesting. The other day I was interviewed and it, it was off time. It wasn't a, about Nicaragua per se, but the person who was interviewing me was a leftist. And she said to me, she said, you know, I, I, I want to, like you, I went to Nicaragua in the eighties. That those were the Sandinista years. And I'm thinking, yeah, well they were, but so were these years, <laughs> but she didn't even know that. Right. People have forgotten what they learned in the eighties, which is too bad. Um, so, uh, I think Just that's three why minutes, uh, Dan. Okay. Three, three more minutes. Thank you. That's why we're having this seminar is to, you know, re-educate people about the realities of Nicaragua. And again, one of the huge ironies, I mean, the tactic of the U S throughout the world, not just in Nicaragua or Central America, throughout the world, we see over and over again in Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Syria. Venezuela. The goal is to sow chaos. Let's be clear. When the U.S. says we're going to intervene to stabilize a country, you should interpret that to mean we're going to intervene to destabilize a country. Now, sometimes they even use those words, destabilize. And that's what the U.S. helped do in 2018, to destabilize the country. And they're going to continue to try to destabilize it. And what the irony of ironies is, you know, when you listen to reports in the U.S. about the migrant, so-called migrant crisis in America, you will often be told without much explanation that the immigrants are coming from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Nicaragua's not on that list. And why is that? Because the Sandinistas have created a relatively prosperous and stable peaceful country. And but if the US gets its way, it will destabilize Nicaragua. And now we'll have migrants coming from Nicaragua, even though we made it clear we don't want any migrants. You know, this is insanity. This this type of foreign policy is insane. And but we have to recognize that is the goal. The US is is sowing chaos throughout the world and, and it's only countries like Nicaragua that are resisting that 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 are going to prevent that and that's why we really need uh to stand by the Nicaraguan people thank you thank thank you so much Dan for your impassioned support of, of Nicaragua you. and uh it's always a pleasure to to hear you speak so so, so thank you very much for for that uh, impassioned uh, and detailed presentation um, it now gives me pleasure to introduce Colleen Littlejohn and Colleen is a development economist with an MA from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in the United States. She has worked for a wide range of organisations such as the Catholic Relief Services, the International Reconstruction Fund, Nicaragua Network, CAPRI, a local development NGO that uh, Colleen founded herself in 1988. Uh, she's also uh, worked for Save the Children in Canada, Managua and, and Toronto and the World Bank in Nicaragua, in Liberia, West Africa and in Washington, D.C. Um, although it says she retired in 2015. <laughs> you don't look very retired to me, Colin. Colin. You seem very active. So uh, it gives us great pleasure to uh, for you to share, share your experiences with you. So uh, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I sometimes wonder where I ever had any time to work before. But anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about protecting Nicaragua's democracy and recovering from the three disasters of the past few years. Uh, restoring peace and protecting democracy after the attempted coup in, in 2018 have been urgent challenges for the Nicaraguan government. As we saw in the 80s, without peace, there's little possibility for development, although that didn't stop the revolutionary government from trying. Uh, I'll never forget a phone call. I was at a, my sister-in-law's house and she got a phone call from Puerto Cabezas, which is now called Bilwe. They had just connected 
the Pacific to the Caribbean coast by phone. And two weeks later, it was, it was bombed down by the Contra. So, so much for development. But anyway, um, back to April 2018, in the months following the initial protests, there were parts of Managua that looked like war zones, scenes that we never saw in the 80s in the capital. The country was on lockdown for months, but not by COVID, but by the violence of the opposition. And by in, but by in July, obstacles were removed, but still tension persisted for a few months. And increased police presence was very welcomed by most of the population. To protect democracy, several laws were passed last year whose content is basically the same as similar laws in other countries. But in Nicaragua, they have been severely criticized in opposition media and human rights NGOs. One was to prohibit foreign donations for political campaigns and to obligate organizations to register what they receive and what those donations are supposed to finance. The other law basically insists in what the U.S. demands in the federal U.S. Code 2383, which states, Whoever incites, sets on foot, assists, or engages in any rebellion or insurrection against the authority of the United States or the laws thereof, or gives comfort thereto, shall be fined under this title and imprisoned not more than 10 years or both, and shall be incapable of holding any office under the United States. There was a similar law passed uh, in Nicaragua, but that severely criticized, as I said, but never in the United States. The violence of the attempted coup caused more economic damage than the emergencies which followed, the pandemic and the hurricanes. The country's average growth rate between 2010 and 17 was a booming 5.1%, one of the best in Latin America. By the end of 18, 2018, economic growth had dropped to minus 4%. At the end of 2019, it was still a negative minus 3.9%. Toward the end of 19, however, there were signs that things were starting to improve, but then came COVID and the hurricanes. GPD growth was again negative for 2020, a minus 2.3. Three years of negative growth after almost 10 years of 5% a year. However, there's a good possibility, according to a recent statement from the president of the Central Bank of Nicaragua just yesterday, that the growth rate for this year, 2021, could reach between 2.5 and 3.5%. Nicaragua was, was the only country in Latin America, for example, that increased its exports this year. But it will take several more years to return to the levels of 5%. Um, but let's look now about how the government faced the two more natural disasters. The COVID pandemic was announced in March of 2020, but the Nicaraguan government began to prepare an interim plan to deal with the virus in January, preparing for the worst scenario. The Ministry of Health prepared 19 hospitals nationwide to treat COVID and the army made their emergency plans to establish huge tent hospitals if necessary. House to house census was taken by community volunteers to identify the high risk population. Regular vaccination campaigns against the flu and pneumonia were carried out early. And Nicaragua never closed its borders, but they did put in place testing requirements for those traveling to the country and quarantine for those, for those entering. I was the first, I was one of the first people to enter, even actually before the first case in Nicaragua. I was coming from Europe and uh, I was called by NINSA every day for 15 days, right at the beginning. The country, as I said, never shut down, nor were schools obligated to close but the Ministry of Education did facilitate school by TV and radio. The worst months were May and June of last year when there were several weeks with more than 400 cases. But by July, more or less, it was pretty clear that the virus was getting under control, although total eradication was never expected and safeguards such as social distancing, masks, hygiene, et cetera, were maintained and promoted through intense communication campaigns, including a 24 hour hotline to the Ministry of Health. And all this was done with much less resources than neighboring countries who were included early on in emergency programs and multilateral funders. Nicaragua did count on solid support from some countries and multilateral support from the Central America Bank for Regional Integration as the region began to work more closely together. Every Tuesday, the Ministry of Health releases a weekly COVID report. And this past week, the Ministry of Health reported a total of 5,407 confirmed positive cases since the beginning of which 5,176 have recovered and 180 people have died. For the week of April 6th to the 13th, 41 new cases confirmed and one death. 
which means that basically when you look at the numbers, Nicarag Nicaragua has one of the lowest death rates per million of population in the world. At some point, Nicaragua's strategy to combat the pandemic will be considered a model and not only for the countries of the South. Up until now, however, only horror stories about COVID in Nicaragua have been published in supposedly serious newspapers such as The Guardian and The New York Times. At present, a very well-organized COVID campaign, vaccination campaign has been going on, giving priority to those over 60 or people with serious chronic conditions. Um, on to the hurricanes. Uh, October is normally the month to expect hurricanes, but the two powerful ones that hit last year and the, uh, to Nicaragua and the rest of Central America were back to back in November. Hurricane Eta, category four, and Iota, category five. Days before the hurricanes hit, over 165,000 people were evacuated from danger zones into shelters, supplied with food, bedding, and medical attention. Initial rebuilding supplies and first responders were also mobilized to the area to quickly restore services after the winds and the flooding subsided. Because of the advanced preparation, very few lives were lost, and those were, pe and those were people who decided not to evacuate or who returned to what was left of their homes, knowing a second hurricane was coming. Within three weeks after the hurricanes, the government assessed damages and losses, negotiated financial support, and advanced on the elaboration and implementation of a recovery plan. The damage was devastating. Over 6,000 homes destroyed, another 38,000 damaged, along with 92 schools, 112 health centers, 11 bridges, over 4,000 kilometers of roads. Or fourth, the Minister of Finance estimated that economic damages from the two hurricanes was over $742 million, equivalent to 6.2% of Nicaragua's gross domestic project, product. But Nicaragua received a check for $30.6 million right away, thanks to the incredible competence of the government and its leaders, including our dearly departed friend, Paul Oquist. Anticipating a worse than normal hurricane session, Nicaragua increased its tropical cyclone insurance coverage from the Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility. And as a result, the country received the much needed payout under the excess rainfall and tropical cyclone policies. Talk about planning. And Nicaragua was also able to negotiate financial support, again, from the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the IMF, sources that had been absent since the passing of the NECA Act in the U.S. Congress, with the exception of projects that had been approved before the Act was passed. The Central American Bank for Economic Integration continued to support reconstruction and recovery projects at higher levels than usual. And I'd like to talk about what was the key to the successful responding to the economic crash following the attempted coup and, on, and the, pandemic, the pandemic and the hurricanes. The analysis is interesting, especially when seeing how other Central American countries have not fared nearly so well, despite having access to much more financial assistance almost immediately. The key for me is the success of the government in their development programming since the FSLN was reelected and assumed power in January of 2007. If another party had won the 2006 elections, I doubt that the, com the country would be looking at a possible 3% growth rate for 2021. We would be probably be the worst off of all the countries of Central America, uh, which is what happened in Hurricane Mitch under President Aleman, over 3,000 dead in one, one community. I read, somewhere, I read somewhere recently that President Ortega had said that it, in the late 80s that he, if he had, had would have the possibility of 10 years of peace, we would all see a new Nicaragua. And that is what happened between 2007 and 2017. Nicaragua achieved incredible results in the rejection of poverty and extreme poverty in economic growth, delivery of basic services in health, education, energy, water, sanitation, women and children's rights, communication, foreign and local investment, land reform, agricultural development, and so many other things. And planning was the key. And the government began to create a national development plan about a year after assuming power in 2007. Very competent people were assigned to top ministry posts, delivering 100% transparency in the use of both national and international funds. On the basis of the first national development plan, the World Bank, where I was working at the time as senior operations officer in Managua, we began to negotiate with the new government its financing plan for the next four years. 
I will never forget greeting Dr. Oakquist as he arrived for the first meeting to start the conversations. I had known him for many years before. In preparation for the World Bank strategy uh, preparation, I, I did, I looked up in the World Bank archives, the earliest socioeconomic study that had been done, done in Nicaragua. It was from 1953, uh, because before I studied economics, I studied history. And so I was interested in what Nicaragua was like years before. I compared the major socioeconomic indicators related to poverty and well-being, social services, infrastructure, and I saw that the figures were not that different from the most recent that we had available. So we're talking statistics from 1953 and 19, um, or 2007, and there hadn't been very much progress at all in all those years. But when, within a few years, that began to change, especially after 2010, and the country started to experience real socioeconomic development very evident when you compare figures from 2005 to 2017. Both poverty and extreme poverty were almost 50% reduced. Poverty from 48.3% to 24.9, and extreme poverty from 17.5 to 6.9. Because of time constraints, I'm only gonna give you a few examples of what have happened during these 10 years, but you will be receiving a link from Louise with a lot more detail and a copy of the latest national development plan. Um, in the plans, infrastructure invest, mess, investments have been a priority because you can't reduce poverty without the basics. Today, Nicaragua is connected physically by the best highways in Central America and in the top five of Latin America, according to the World Economic Forum. 99% of the population will have electricity by the end of 2021. It was 54% in 2006. And about 80% of the electricity that, that will be generated this year and next year will be from renewable sources. It was only 26% in 2006. 65 of the, only 65% of the population had access to portable water in 2006. It was 91.8% in 2018, and the projections are now 95 Three minutes, Colleen, three minutes. Okay. Um, as I said, I'm not going to go over all the different, uh, well, let me just say. One of the, also the legacies of which, which guaranteed success with COVID was the community-based preventative health system, a heritage from the late 70s and the 80s that had been strengthened over the last 13 years with the restoration in 2007 of the human right of few, free health services for all and massive investments in the training and preparation of health workers, as well as the construction of hospital centers and, and, and centers throughout the world, throughout the country, excuse me. Uh, the country's health budget has risen 319% since 2006. With respect to food security, since 2007, the government has already has also made significant investments in grassroots agriculture production and urban credit, microcredit, prioritizing women. Um, with this respect to citizen security, Nicaragua has developed a world-class civil, civil defense disaster prevention and mitigation program, which we saw working over the hurricanes. And over the last 10 years, the government has invested significant resources for the economic, social, technical, and physical integration of the Caribbean coast. Those investments greatly facilitated the emergency response of the last hurricane season. Getting emergency supplies, supplies in eight hours by road instead of three or four days makes a big difference. So what has been the key to responding to the economic crash post-coup attempts, post-hurricane, and right now, the COVID, Basically, the government has intensified all of the above programs, more health, more education, more public works, more employment generation activities for small and medium producers, all defined in the just released National Development Plan 21-26. And that's all of the above is why you don't see thousands of Nicaraguans marching towards Mexico and the United States with their neighbors from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. A recent opinion Poll indicated that the number of Nicaraguans disposed to immigrate has fallen by half since 2005, 2006. And by December of 2020, over 80,000 Nicaraguans had returned from home from other countries in Central America. More than 10,000 came from Panama where Nicaraguans living there were faced with massive unemployment, no health care, and 5,000 new cases of COVID a day in the country as a whole. Now some final words. If there was one word to describe Nicaragua, its people and its revolution, it's resilience. Resilience in the face of constant threats, especially in an election year where a constant of US foreign policy has been to try to guarantee the defeat of the FSLN. 
We saw this in 1984 and in 1989, as Dan said, when a gun was held to the heads of Nicaraguans. Vote, for the, vote against the FSLN and we guarantee you six more years of war and destruction. The FSLN accepted the defeat and became the opposition. And in every election since 2006, the US has financed the opposition, but never to the extent that has been seen since the FSLN won in 2006, with most money spent by the US in 2017, clearly preparing for the, for the elections coming this year. And clearly, clearly preparing also for the attempted coup of April of 2008 and and the elections that will be held in November of this year. Thanks very much. Many thanks, Colleen. That's uh, just given us such a great insight into the meticulous planning that brings about the great results that we see at every, every level in, in Nicaraguan society. And I think, uh, as, as many have rightly said, that uh, sort of comparison with how, how little the impact of the hurricanes and COVID has been on the Nicaraguan population compared to many, many countries in, in the region. So thank you very much for that very detailed and on hand uh, uh, um, impression of what's been happening. Th thank you, that's really good. Right, so our last but not least, um, Her Excellency Giselle Morales Echeverre, as I said before, the Nicaraguan ambassador to the UK, Ireland and Iceland, uh, would like to just give, give pass over to you, Giselle, for some summary comments. Thank you, thank you, Julie. Well, we, we have heard in very, our previous speakers, Dan, Niels and Judy uh, in, and Colleen, have explained, you know, the situation in Nicaragua from 2018, the coup attempt, the effects, how we come, how the people got together to defeat that coup, and uh, also how the U.S. has been and has been financing this uh, this regime change agenda. And, but that is not only in Nicaragua that has been, you have seen it recently in Cuba, you have risen, you have seen it in Venezuela. So it, it is a pattern to every country that is stand up and defend their sovereignty and the right to be uh, independent and to be, to have their own, uh, not to uh, submit to the will of other countries, but to the will to, the, to their own people. So Colleen also has given us a very uh, complete picture of why we, um, why the revolution is still there? Why the social transformation is still there? And it is because um, a social transformation or revolution required both political power that the government, Sandinista government has, but also the participation of the people. Without politi political power, revolutionary pro pro programs will not have the material resources they require. And without the participation of the people, revolutionary programs, even with resources, cannot be put in practice, neither defended. So right now, Nicaragua, after that curtain, although the the, 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 the difficult economic situation that put us, even with a, um, after that in 2018, in 2019, in 2002, we were recovering, you mentioned Colleen, and in 2020, we had these hurricanes in nine, in, and we have COVID the whole, the whole year. So even in the whole economic, international economic, effects of COVID. Uh, so even with that, um, right now we see, I think, Nicaragua have both. And we are making great progress in building a new society. Uh, and we call it, in Latin America, call it the buen vivir. That's what we are developing. We, we want our people to have a good life. And that is what we are building. So Nicaragua is demonstrating, you have heard, um, the meaning of 
a tra transforming a, soci a society that is putting people before profits. And that's what we are doing. And this is precisely be beside the historical confrontation and history of dominations in Nicaragua since, since our very rest be be became a, recently became a, a, a nation in 1856. Uh, this is one of the reasons why the United States is targeting Nicaragua through hybrid welfare, including the misinformation campaign that Dan and Mills explained very, very well. Uh, the application of the Sharp uh, manual and then many other manuals uh, of, of terrorists that create terrorism in, in the country. So, uh, and the direct interference in the politics of the country, they finance, that's clear. This is very clear, the financing of the 2018 coup and the economic attacks and sanctions that you have heard of. 2020 was a difficult, I said, um, but measures were taken. The, 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 the way we confront the hurricane, uh, uh, the, the two hurricanes and the COVID, was success has been successful because of the will of the government to put people first, but also the support of the people, the participation of the people. Without that, it wouldn't be possible. Not with our resources. Visiting and educating five million visits to create awareness and education and track and trace the COVID would not be possible with our resources. It was the support and the participation of the people. Um, people are, we believe, people is the protagonist of this revolution. So they have their will and the power in their hands. So therefore, 2021 is a crucial year because it means we are working on the economic recovery. We are working in deepen uh, and expanding the, um, particularly the reduction of poverty, particularly in the Caribbean side of the country that has never, that never before has seen the investment and development in, in health and education and roads in, 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 in the, for the first time. You remember Colleen, the first call <laughs> well, now we they can the they, 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 they Bluefields is connected by a road, and and now we are just there to connect uh, North Caribbean, Puerto Cabezas, Bilwi, and all the communities, indigenous communities, to the rest of the country. And that is uh, something that is 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 very important for the unity of Nicaragua. Uh, because also we're going to, going to have elections this year in, Gen in November. So in January 2021, President called the, the Nicaraguans to be united. He said, Nicaragua, let us unite and we will be stronger to defeat poverty. We will be stronger to have more employment, more education, more health. We will be stronger to live with dignity. So that is... Um, that is the call. We can, we can be a government, but without the people, we are, there is no possibility to advance. So the latest survey, uh, and I am looking at it just right now on, of March 2021, is showing... Sake, just one minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, uh, I'll go back all of these. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, in August 2020 they, they, that um, we believe that there will not be, uh, that the sanctions will not be revert, even with this new, um, oh, in, unfortunately, with this new um, regime in the US, we believe that the NICAD will continue there. It has been was supported, but but, but President Biden, when he was a member of, of, the, of the Congress, of the Senate. So in, in, in also to, in 2020, there was the responsive action in Nicaragua, this program, GRAIN, uh, near 
uh, the, the, the closest is the elections. There are new uh, ways of destroying the, this project, this revolutionary project. And that uh, is another uh, intention to, to, to uh, stop the revolution. In November um, 2020, before Trump left, the, the, he extended for one more year the executive order with respect to Nicaragua, stating that the country, all a small country, the second poorest country in the in the Latin American, economically speaking, in the Latin America and in the Americas is an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. And that is insane, of course. And so that makes no sense. So le later this year, sorry, but I have to say it, later this year, um, we, uh, uh, in, we have now the Renacer, the Nicaragua adherence to condition for electoral reform it's a law that has been put it uh, to, to in the United States by um, by the what's the what his name is Bo Menendez to the Senate. Uh, he's chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he and they are as Dan said putting a card again to the Nicaraguans. You do you vote against the Sandinistas, oh, and then you will sanctions will continue the same way they did it in the nineties. So, um, so the, in March 16, just a few days ago, the head of the Southern Command of the U.S. Army, Craig Fowler, accused that Managua maintains close ties with Moscow. He also assured in an appearance to the Senate that Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua are a direct threat to the United States. They are a daunting challenge that we cannot face on our own, he said. The only way to counter this threat there is to strengthen our partners in the region. Consequently, we expect that in the first place, the emphasis of the U.S. strategy is not towards... You're summarizing, uh, Your Excellency. <laughs> yes, just to finish, I'm not going to repeat anything. I just wanted to ensure you that um, 2021 should be a year of recovery, and we will recover. The Nicaragua economy has have been the less damaged in Central America because of the strategy, economic strategy we had against COVID. We defeat their failed attempted coup and we have recovered that. And, and we, um, we must also work, everyone, I think all solidarity should protect our revolutions, our societies, the over progressive governments of Latin America that are targeted by US foreign policy for daring to, to, uh, to hold high the, ban, the, the banner for self-determination and sovereignty. Um, we ask you, as well as to all progressive for, forces around the world, to redouble the solidarity efforts, to ensure that Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela, and all progressive governments in Latin America survives and without external interference to preserve our sovereignty, our determination, and the right to determine our future. Nicaragua will continue to its revolution as long as we have you as a friend, as long as Nicaragua have some and others that love her, Nicaragua will be free. And the Sandinista revolution will not stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giselle, breaks my heart to put you off in the, with all the important things that you need to bring us and uh, obviously you convey just why that revolution is so important in, in the way you, you speak about the country you love and, and, the, and the love that Nicaragua brings to Nicaraguans and, and to the world so so thank you so much. Uh, just running a little, little bit late and we obviously want to have some time for questions so if you, uh, I've just had an, another question um, so I'm going to present this straight to you Dan if you don't mind, we just wondered if uh, you'd be able to to say a little bit more uh, about the US response to its attempted coup earlier this year and uh, the differences that you've noted in the way that's been covered in, in the media to the attempted coup in, in Nicaragua. That would be really helpful. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, well, uh, again, there, were, there are certainly similarities 
um, of what happened. As we know, on January 6th of this year, there were uh, a number of, of right-wing protesters, some armed uh, with guns and, and other weapons who essentially invaded the Capitol building of the United States, some with the intent to look like to, to take hostage some of the Congress people, uh, maybe even kill some, including Vice President uh, Mike Pence, who's also was president of the Senate. Um, and again, the media almost, you know, invariably condemned um, this attack as an attempted coup, uh, condemned the violence uh, that took place, in which I think ultimately maybe three, two to three policemen died, ultimately, if you count one who, who committed suicide afterwards. Um, but again, uh, this looked a lot uh, like what happened in 2018 when people also, again, violently attacked um, government and party buildings, uh, attacked police officers, including killing, as I said, at least 22 of them, sometimes after torturing them. Um, the, the big difference is that the violence in Nicaragua was much worse um, that the right wing carried out and lasted much longer. I mean, the January 6th was a pretty short-lived uprising, which again was condemned. Meanwhile, what happened in Nicaragua, again, this months long uh, counter insurgency, which is really what it was, counter revolution that the US backed uh, was applauded by nearly every media outlet in the United States and even applauded, I'm sorry, by many on the left in the United States. I went to a panel discussion on what was happening in Nicaragua. I think this was in June of 2018 at the University of Pittsburgh. And the only three speakers there were some of these um leaders of of the coup, some of these student or allegedly student uh, leaders of the coup. And and, and, and it was a, uh, an event largely attended by academics, students and professors of Latin American history who, um, again, we're comparing the uprising to the Sandinista revolution of 1979, which is absurd. Right, and so you have on the one hand a fairly, frankly, modest uprising in the U.S. January 6th, which is condemned uh, by everyone, particularly on the left of the spectrum, and then you have um, a much more brutal counter-revolution um, in 2018, which lasted from what mid-April to to about mid-July of of that year in which, you know, at least a couple hundred people died and uh, many people were terrorized, um, injured, some people raped. Um, and again, um, this was seen as some sort of popular democratic uprising that, that again, most groups in the US applauded, including by the way, Democracy Now!, which is a left-wing or purportedly uh, left-wing uh, program which had several um, several debates, if you want to call them that, about what was happening in Nicaragua, including with Paul Oquist um, and uh, Camilo Mejia as well. And those taking the side of the Nicaraguan government were really, I, I think, pretty disrespectfully treated by by Amy Goodman. On, on democracy now. And so again, the differences between those two events and how they were perceived, I mean, is pretty stark and pretty telling about, about where we're at in terms of media uh, bias in the United States.
thank you thank you very very much uh, dan that that's that's really helpful um i think this might be something arising from your contribution niels um just to clarify a little bit further uh, you, you mentioned about um the people fermenting the violence in 2018 and i think one of your slides mentioned about the ngos and human rights groups could you just add a little bit more niels of to explain that that detail um i think just to give a little bit more detail if you if you're there <laughs> Is Neil's there? Has, has Neil's had to leave? Sorry. Um, so I don't know if any, if you wanted to answer that one, Colleen. Just um, a little bit about the it was it was in Neil's slide, uh, but just to say a bit more about who was exactly who was fermenting the violence. The what what we mean what sort of meant by the NGOs and human rights groups, as well as the funding from the United States. Did you take your mute button off, Kelly? Yeah, okay. Um, I don't have a lot of information, but what I did see then was a real mix of, um, you know, ex-Sandinistas organized into their little political party. Um, I, there were some Mosistas. It was just a whole mix of people, but then you have sort of divided who financed it, who financed it. Uh, that was the United States for a long time who did it and who organized it and who, who was paid to do it. So it, it was just a whole mix. I'm not really like, I, I don't have names, et cetera, but um, um, there were people sort of running the show and people being paid to, uh, to do it. You know? uh, and then uh, you know, at the very, very beginning and people in the streets confused, but then when they realized they were confused, they went home, you know, but, um, uh, but some didn't. So, but there was, as Niels was saying, the, the whole, uh, what do you call it, Facebook and social media thing was organized years and years in advance. In fact, the weird thing the other day was I got, I got in my memories of Facebook, uh, a Facebook memory of seven years ago or five years ago. And it had the, the picture of, you know, that, that kid that was saying to President Ortega, you have to, you know, when are you leaving? You know, he started um, a Facebook page or something like that or a group and then April 2018 he changes the name of it so I just thought this is very weird but I don't you know I'm not a real specialist on all these things but um but it was a, a minority and and the money did uh the money talked as far as the actual perpetrating some of the violence thank you, thank you very much uh, we've just got a couple more questions. We say we're run, running. We've already run ahead um, of time. So, um, just just very briefly, the question from Helen about Nicaraguans returning from Costa Rica uh, during the during the COVID. I just wondered if either you, uh, Dan, or or Colleen, want to pick that one up. Colleen, um, you know, yeah, the, the Costa Rican border just opened on April fifth, so it was very difficult for people to come in or or um, out. Um, I think there was coordination between the governments as far as some people coming back. Um, there was a lot of people coming back illegally. So, and, and so there were Costa Rican authorities and, Nicar and, and Nicaraguan authorities taking, you know, um, custodian, you know, taking care of the border area more than anything to make sure that these people as they came home were getting, you know, tested for COVID or if they had any symptoms or if they went into quarantine. Um, so um, I'm not sure about the numbers. I know the numbers in Panama because I was just in Panama a couple of weeks ago. So, <laughs> but uh, I didn't look at Costa Rica, et cetera. But uh, the, the back and forth with Costa Rica will be, has been open now, but the legal going and coming was closed for almost a year. A year. So the people who did come were um, illegal and I'm not sure about the numbers. Thanks very much, Colleen. And, um I couldn't remember if I mentioned this before, but I just wanted to re remind everybody about the forthcoming webinar this this forthcoming Sunday, the 18th of April at seven o'clock, organised by our friends, the Alliance for Global Justice. It's called Media Disinformation on Nicaragua, a tool in US conventional warfare. So if uh, the people have asked uh, these questions, if uh, you wanted to get a more detailed uh, exploration of, of that, then there's there's the uh, place to go on this forthcoming Sunday. I think um, the uh, there'll be a, there'll be the details in in, in the chat there, um, and um, just 
I think there's a question there. That perhaps if you can very quickly answer it, I know that's a bit unfair to say very quickly because it's a detailed question. Um, there is current in the um, there is a current in the U.S. Congress who have been demanding the suspension of sanctions. So I just wondered if uh, you, you knew anything, you could tell us anything about that. About yeah. It, yes, as you say, um, you know, when Biden uh, took office, he promised to at least uh, take another look at sanctions and reconsider uh, sanctions policy against various countries. And there is a, a move amongst a, a, a fairly small group of U.S. senators uh, pushing Biden to, to rethink the sanctions policy of the U.S. and to lift sanctions uh, against varying uh, countries on the, on, on the basis that these sanctions particularly during the pandemic are literally killing people. You know, um, the numbers in Venezuela, for example, are astronomical. In one year alone, between 2017 and 2018, the uh, CEPR, the, uh, uh, what is it? The uh, um, Center for Economic Policy Research did a study showing that 40,000 Venezuelans died in one year due to the sanctions, 40,000. You know, so these are very deadly sanctions. And again, there is a move to get Biden to reconsider them. I think that, you know, I think it's a long shot that he would do that, particularly when it comes to Nicaragua and Venezuela and Cuba. But I think it's worth supporting that effort. I mean, there is at least an emerging effort uh, to question U.S. the U.S. sanctions regime, which I think is sanctioning something like 35 different countries, um, and I think we should be part of 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 the movement to to do that. Oh, well, thank you, thank you very much, Dan. I uh, heard um, Venezuelan speaking recently uh, to say that you know we use this word sanctions, but sanctions are applied to people who've done something wrong, and Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela have only done something right. For the benefit of their of their population, so I think um, one of the things that we we can do in solidarity is to, as we've tried to do a little bit tonight, is un unpick that uh, unpick that language. Um, so so to unpick that language of sanctions, nothing nothing wrong has been, and this, the deadly nature that they are deadly, uh, and um, and and do kill people as you've just illustrated in in great numbers. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for answering the question tonight. There was only other one question. I think it was just to clarify, Giselle, that sadly Paul um, ha, would, was a victim of of COVID. Somebody's asked that. Is can you just confirm that, that uh, was? Well, okay. I, I have no confirmation. You know, there is no official confirmation. Neither the family or the office that I that I know about. Uh, people is speaking about it, saying it is, but I cannot truly have the fact that it is. So uh, forgive me if I cannot be uh, completely, but I'm being honest, I don't, um, I can have my view. Although I think the importance of Polokis is not how he died, it's how he lived. And the much, much he gave, not only to Nicaragua, but he gave to the, to the, uh, social progression pro progression in, in, in Latin America and also his stance, very, very strong stance on climate change and anti-imperialism. Thank you. And I think that's a, a really important note to end, isn't it? It's not how someone dies, it's how how they live and really a message for us that we we stand with our, our, our brothers and sisters in Nicaragua in our lives and, and we, we take we take our opportunity to uh, to stand to stand with you. Um, as those of you who've been to Nicaragua, you can hear from our speakers tonight how passionately people feel. I, I love Dan's expression of the the red and black blood running in your veins. <laughs> um, so you know, people who who know Nicaragua, who visited, feel very passionately about about the right of Nicaraguans. Uh, to, to defend their country, to live in peace, that buen vivir, that good living. What, what a wonderful aspiration. And isn't that the basis of all human life, that we are simply allowed to live our lives fully and well? Um, and, you know, without that external aggression interference. 
Um, we've also looked to Nicaragua, as we've heard tonight, for these very relevant models of, of how to build a better world. It isn't just a, an empty phrase. This better world is being built there with, with the good roads, the communication, the health, the economy, the quality of food, the supply of food and food sovereignty. So it's, it's a great model uh, and how to defeat the, you know, to, to respond to the, the awfulness of, of climate disaster as in the two hurricanes, and also how to, how to, to build and, and demand a chain, climate change as, uh, as we, we've heard uh, Paul, Dr. Paul O'Keefe did so, so very well. So we need to stand in solidarity. We need to tell Nicaragua's truth, share what you've learned tonight, uh, watch Dan's film, read the books uh, that he's written and, um, and all the other things that we've seen there, attend the webinars. And when it's safe to do so, go to Nicaragua, see for yourself, eat that delicious food, share the joy of Nicaraguans. Um, a great practical way that you can do in the meantime is to affiliate to the Nicaragua Solidarity Campaign Action Group details, in the chat. Um, also very, very important to get your trades union uh, and your organisations affiliated because that, that affiliation funds uh, the, the webinars and things that, that we can organise. Act where possible against US aggression and sanctions. Show them up for what they are in terms of killers um, and do, do everything as individually and collectively and defend wherever possible. N Nicaragua's not national sovereignty and right to determine its own future and that's going to be particularly important over the next few months so heartfelt thanks to our wonderful speakers uh, Niels uh, was in a lovely position of expecting the arrival of his second child so he's had to hurry away so we, we wish him well um, so many thanks to, to Niels McEwen to Dan Kovalik to Colleen Littlejohn and Her Excellency Giselle Morales Echevere now behind every brilliant speaker is a brilliant technician and a brilliant person who prepares notes and organizes the agenda. And those people are Louise Richards, uh, Brittany Oakes and, and uh, Ricardo Carioni. So thank you so much for, for all, to all of you for enabling this excellent meeting to take place and, and to be broadcast. And thank you, and no meeting is of any value whatsoever if we don't have participants. So thank you so much, all of you who have, um, who have been here with us this evening and we look forward to your continued support and solidarity with the wonderful people of, of Nicaragua. So many, many thanks and uh, have a lovely day or a lovely evening. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.